It is good to be with all of you this morning. I can't tell if it's still winter or spring or somewhere in between. Somebody said it's like first spring and not the second or 14th spring that we usually have around here. <laughs> but it is, it is good to be able to be together and worship the Lord together as we prepare our hearts for, for Holy Week, uh, looking to Palm Sunday next Sunday and Easter the week after that. It is good to, uh, today we're going to be looking at a moment when Jesus turns his face toward Jerusalem. Um, and he's gone through so many different storms and um, miracles and all of these things. Uh, the comforting thing about the stories today is that Jesus' disciples are idiots. <laughs> they make mistakes over and over and over again. And yet the Lord knows who they are. He has compassion on them. And he has a plan for them. He wants to send them out. He has more plans for them than they even know for themselves. Um, so let's turn to our scripture today. Let me pray first for us. Lord God, we do thank you that you, <laughs> you factored in our stupidity when you called us. You knew who we were. You know that we are dust. You know that we are weak. You know that we have no idea what we're doing. But you, Lord, are compassionate you are slow to anger and abounding in love. You are the one who wants to reach out to us, to reach down into the waters when we're drowning, to, to reach beyond our, our, our false notions and bring us your truth. Lord, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us this morning as we turn to your word and seek your truth, the words that you have to say to us today. Make them come alive for us. Open our ears and our eyes, our hearts and our souls to your powerful word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our first scripture this morning comes from Psalm 111. This is starting with verse 2. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. And turning over to Mark 10, Jesus has just done miracle after miracle after miracle, and now he sets his face toward Jerusalem. They were on their way up to Jerusalem when Jesus, leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and to the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, Teacher, they said, we want you to do for, for us whatever, you, whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became, became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of the first questions that our uh, study today asks is, what is the greatest need that you've ever had answered? I told in my, uh, in my newsletter this week about a story from World Vision Days. As I was thinking about my own stories, um, some of you have heard this one before, but I just love it so much. Uh, this, this need that I had, my, my biggest problem, you know, I spent a lot of time traveling in Africa, and my biggest problem was anxiety. 
I would literally like have a panic attack the night before I left on any overseas trip. My parents were used to me calling and going, <laughs> like, it's going to be okay. God's going to be with you. And so this one trip, I was in Angola. It was, it was kind of in the middle of the Civil War time, and it was a rough place to be. And, and I was like, this time I am not going to be afraid. I am going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to let go of anxiety and trust that God's got me. Like, you know, best laid plans, right? So I get on this plane. I was, it was, we were going between two provincial capitals, and we, were, we, we flew out. And the guy that I was flying with had, had flown this route before. And he goes, by the way, and this is like a 10-seater plane. He's like, by the way, this airstrip's really short, and it's at the top of a mountain. Okay, I'm going to be like not anxious today, not anxious today, not anxious today. And, and, and the wind is terrible. So we get to the airstrip and the guy with me again says, this is really short. We have to land about the, within the first third of the airstrip or we're not going to stop in time. <laughs> so we, we, we come around and the plane is just doing this kind of thing. And, and I'm like going, all right, <laughs> be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. And, and the, the airstrip is just going by and going by. And I'm like, okay, that's more than a third. <laughs> and the pilot gives up and, and pulls out again. And he comes back around and the same thing happens. And I'm like, oh, that was more than a third. And, and, and this time I look down and there literally is a, the, like the carcass of a plane at the bottom of the cliff at the end of the runway. And I'm like, okay, be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. Guy pulls back around and says to the, the, all of us, if we can't make it this time, we're going to have to go back where we came from and give up. I'm like, and I really needed to be, like, my, uh, the project I needed to be with was in that town. I'm like, Lord, you know, you're going to have to pull this off, but I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to be afraid. <laughs> So we, we, we start coming around again, and I, the, the same thing again. I'm sure that's more than a third of the airstrip. He sets down. I'm like, okay, God, you, you got this. I know you got this. I look at the pilot, that there's two pilots, and they're holding the, what is it called, the yoke, the, the steering wheel, and they're pulling back as hard as they possibly can. I'm like, please stop, please stop, please stop, please stop. We stopped six feet off the end of the runway. <laughs> and I, I got out of the plane, and, and, and the, the hill was just starting to go down where the plane stopped. And I was like, okay, Lord. <laughs> it was just one of those moments where, okay, maybe I should have been afraid. <laughs> but God had promised to take care of me. He had promised to, to be, to, do not fear, for God, I am with you. And I was holding on to that so much. That didn't mean that was the end of my panic attacks at all, at all. But God reminded me that he had me in the palm of his hand, even when it looks impossible. Jesus Christ loves us more than we can imagine. And as we look at God providing over and over in our stories today, we see that often the disciples are looking for what's in it for them. The people that are following Jesus want to know what's in it for them. They want to, to, to be fed. They want to be safe. They, they want to triumph. And Jesus is saying, be in it for me, not for what I can provide you. I am the Prince of Peace. I am the one who is with you. I am the one who will do immeasurably more than all you could ask or imagine. You have no idea, even now, who I am. As we look at these stories today, the, the first story that uh, we share is the, the feeding of the 5,000. You may remember that John the Baptist has just been beheaded by King Herod. Jesus is grieving. As this was his cousin that was killed. He was a, a very important man in the, at the time, a prophet. He was the one who baptized Jesus himself. And now he had been killed, and Jesus was grieving. And he brought his disciples. They were heading to a, an empty part of the, the lake shore, the Sea of Galilee, hoping to get a little bit of a retreat in. But when they got there, there were thousands of people gathered. And, and Jesus, it says, he had compassion on them because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. Jesus had compassion on these hordes that were, were there. They were there to be healed and, and, and everything taught and they, they were just lost sheep and they needed a savior so of course jesus t teaches all day he's healing people uh, and then the disciples come up and said you know it's getting to be uh late in the day they're hungry we should send them away i, I love how the disciples are very practical but they can be dense when they're talking to the son of god who made heaven and earth don't you think that he could come up with lunch <laughs> 
Jesus says, well, you feed them. And they instantly are like, you know, I got nothing. Turn their pockets out. I'm like, I'm sorry. But there's one of them almost sarcastically brings this kid up. You know, he's got two sardines and a few pita. Go ahead, Lord. What are you going to do with that? <laughs> there's actually a stained glass window up here in this, this window in the transept that, uh, that has that scene where the, the little boy is bringing his tiny little offering. But Jesus knows who he is, and he knows what he can provide for these people. And so he starts handing it out. He hands it to the disciples. They start handing it out. And somehow, somewhere between Jesus and the people receiving it, that bread multiplied over and over and over. And they brought up 12 baskets full of leftovers after everyone had eaten. Of course, the crowd wanted more miracles. They wanted more healing. They wanted more food. They, they wanted the, the stuff that Jesus could give them. But Jesus had other people to reach out to. He had other people to save. So he sent the disciples out on the boat again. He went up into the hills to pray, to be with the Lord. It's an interesting rhythm that Jesus has. You would think that if he was the savior of the universe that he'd want to just keep going 24 7 but jesus knows that he needs to rest he puts limits on himself so that he can rest and be present with the father he's not asking for the father to do for, for what what he can do for jesus he's wanting to spend time with his dad one of my friends was talking to me about what it means to be childlike. Jesus applauds children and says, you should have a childlike faith. Come to me as these children have. And the, the thing that she said was that that means we should come as, as to our father, as, as wanting to be in relationship with daddy. It's not, just, it, it's not just for what daddy can give us, but just because we want to spend time with our father and that's how Jesus was he wanted to go and spend time with his father well of course if the apostles are on the water something bad is going to happen to them so of course another storm came up and they were rowing and rowing and not getting anywhere they were just heading straight into a headwind and they couldn't make any progress at all and the wind is blowing and the waves are turning and all of a sudden they see someone coming toward them and obviously, they first thought that has to be a ghost. No, there's no human being could walk across water like that. It's not possible. And yet, Jesus says, don't be afraid. It's me. It's me. Don't you recognize me? Well, Peter, you know, he's, he, Peter's the one that's all f full of bluster and, and, and bravado. And so he's like, well, if it really is you, then I'm coming out. <laughs> Invite me to come walk to you. And Jesus says, come on. Peter, thinking that he can do this, watch this. He's like all for selfish and showmanship. He walks out onto the water and instantly sees the wind and wave and sinks. He gives up. He panics. He, he thinks he knows. He thinks he's got this. But he doesn't realize that he has to keep his eyes on Jesus. He wants Jesus' cool miracles, but he doesn't keep his eyes on the Lord himself. And of course, he sinks right away. Last week, we talked about Jesus calming the storm, and they all were like, who is this that can calm the wind and the waves? This time, they said, who is this? And then their response was, and they, they climbed into the boat, the wind died down, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Finally, they got a little bit of a glimpse that Jesus Christ is not just a cool guy who does magic tricks. He is the son of God. And they fall and they worship him. That's finally the right response for these, these disciples who've been in it for what they can get for themselves, but they, they don't stay there very long. And now we see Jesus turning his face toward Jerusalem. Jesus, the one who can calm the storm and the waves and feed 5,000 people with, with two sardines, he can do anything he wants to do, and yet he turns his face toward Jerusalem. Why would you do that when that is where they are planning to kill you? Everybody who was going with him, they, were, they knew that Jesus was, was under suspicion by the Pharisees. They knew they were going to try to kill him, and, and they're afraid. They're astonished that he's doing this. And, and most of the people who are with him are afraid. Why in the world would he do this? And then, then he kind of confirms their fears. Hey, I am going to do Jerusalem. I'm going to be accused and arrested and flogged and killed. 
And then on the third day, I will rise again. But it's funny with James and, and John, it's like they didn't even hear it. They're like, oh, Jesus is able to do all of this stuff. He's going to actually, he's saying this, but he's actually going to conquer everybody. And then we get to be in power. They like, like blow off Jesus' prediction of his death. And once again, are idiots. <laughs> but somehow Jesus is still kind and compassionate to them. He still knows that even with all of their delusions of grandeur, he knows what kind of life they are going to have to have. He knows. They, they say, Jesus, we want to sit at your right hand and on your left. We want to be in those places of power. He says, it's not for me to give you. The, the, those seats have already been apportioned. The only other place that we see that term, the right and the left, mentioned in this whole gospel is by the two on the right and the left of Jesus on their own crosses. The two thieves on the right and the left. James and John weren't able to be on the right or the left because two thieves were there. One who realized that Jesus was the Son of God and the other who refused to believe. James and John have this idea that Jesus, the one who can turn water into wine and, and, and have a miraculous catch of fish and feed 5,000 people, he's the one that's going to be in such power that they get to be right there with him. They are going to be in power also. They will be, you know, they'll conquer the Romans and then grab that power and they'll get to do whatever they want. Jesus is like, you're, you're thinking too small. You have no idea what I'm about to do. Jesus then tells them, you know, if he asks them, can you be baptized with the baptism that, that I'm about to be baptized with? He's talking about death, baptized unto death. And they're like, well, of course we can. <laughs> hey, we've gotten this far. He knows James is going to be the first disciple killed in the persecution in Acts. He knows that John is going to be persecuted and persecuted, but somehow he's going to survive the longest of all of them so that he can tell the tale. Jesus knows the miracles that they are going to do themselves. But right now they're thinking about themselves and not the work that God has for them. As much as we try to trust and to believe, so often we think about Jesus as someone who can give us what we need, not as someone we can come to as a child comes to a father. Just to be with him for who he is. To be with him through the worst life, days of his life. And then seeing him risen again on that Easter Sunday morning. The disciples aren't thinking about Jesus. They're thinking about themselves. The saddest night of all of this was the night of, uh, at, at Gethsemane. We'll celebrate this on Thursday, at Monday Thursday, as Jesus shared the Last Supper with his disciples. And then he went to Gethsemane to pray. And he asked the disciples to be with him and to pray with him. And what happened? They fell asleep. And they fell asleep three times. He kept asking for them to be with him. But they, they, they saw their own need, their own sleepiness, their own uh, physical needs. He finally had compassion on them and went and wept tears with so much stress that the blood was coming out of his forehead. But Jesus loved these disciples anyway. He saw all of their weaknesses, all of their mistakes, all of their foibles. He, he knew from the beginning that Peter would be the one to say, I've never met him. I don't know this guy. Peter denied him three times on that night that he was, Jesus was betrayed by Judas and then by Peter. But Jesus saw beyond the cross. He saw beyond death. He saw beyond what the world would consider failure and saw into great kingdom power, not the power of the Romans, not the power of humanity, but the power of God to conquer sin and to conquer death. Brothers and sisters, so often we go into, into faith thinking, well, at least this will make me happy. At least God will fix everything in my life now that I'm a Christian, and I hate to break it to you, but that's not how it works. Most of you know that there are days that it is really, really hard. Jesus wants to be with us in the middle of the storm. He wants to be with us and wants us to know him, whether we are in plenty or in want. There's an amazing um, passage in Habakkuk that it says, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, 
The olive crops fail and fields produce no fruit. There, there, and there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Psalm 42 has a similar statement. Why, my soul, are you so downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my master and my God. You can kind of hear the psalmist digging his toes into the rock and saying, I will yet praise you. I know that you are a good God, even though I can't see it right now. Even though you're not filling my deepest desires, I will trust you. Because I desire you more than anything else. I love that song that we just sang, Gratitude, that, that when we have nothing, we have nothing fit for a king. We have nothing except to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for all that you have pro provided. Thank you for your promises. Even though it is dark at this moment, I know that you are God and you will work this together for good. I know that you have a plan and I know that you have me in the palm of your hand. One of the most amazing stories about this kind of trust is St. Patrick, as we celebrate St. Patrick's Day today. St. Patrick was, was captured and, and put, it, used as a slave in Ireland. That was how he got to Ireland in the, in the first place. He was a slave. But yet he knew his God and he knew a love for these people, even who enslaved him. He finally escaped and was able to go back to England, but yet he knew that God had a plan for him. Just as Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem, he said, St. Patrick set his face toward Ireland. And what, most of his friends must have said, you're crazy. Those are the people that put you in slavery. And yet he knew God's love for that island, and he wanted to go back, and he wanted to share he trusted God. He knew what it was like to lack. He knew what it was like to have nothing. He knew what it was like to be treated as dirt. And yet he knew that his God was infinitely more than all he could ask or imagine. We, uh, you may remember a few years ago, an EPC pastor was arrested and, and held in a Turkish prison for two years. I got to see him at General Assembly a couple of times, and one of the things that he said was, I trust God to protect me, unless not protecting me will bring him more glory. Unless not protecting me will bring him more glory. That is the confidence of a relationship with a good God, even in the middle of our hardest times, knowing that he has a plan, even when it doesn't make sense to us. God has us in the palm of his hand. Brothers and sisters, despite all of our mistakes, all of the ways that we misjudge God, all the ways that we can be selfish and self-centered and, and even wanting to show off, Jesus sees us. He knows that we are dust. He knows that we are nothing. And he loves us because he created us and he calls us his dearly beloved children. Brothers and sisters, whatever storms you're going through right now, whatever your deep need, know that Jesus Christ is right there with you. He is guiding you. He will always provide a shelter and a sanctuary. He will pour out his love on you, your, his forgiveness on you. He will redeem all of your mistakes, all of your wanderings and wanderings, and he will bring you into his presence forevermore. Let's pray together. Holy God, we do thank you and we praise you for who you are. Lord, you are our safety in storms. You are the one who can calm winds and waves. You are the one who can provide everything we need. But Lord, forgive us for looking at your provision more than we look to your face. Lord God, you are the one who is full of love and mercy and grace. Lord, we pray that you would make us like children running to daddy, wanting to see your amazing love for us and your love for the world as you looked out on them and saw them as sheep without a shepherd. Lord, give us compassionate hearts for the world around us. Forgive us for judging before we love. Lord, we pray that you would help us to, to see the brokenness in ourselves at first before we see the brokenness in others so that we can, can love with compassion knowing that you have poured out your love on us, that we can love because you loved us first. Lord God, we pray that you would transform our lives 
so that we may reflect you and introduce you to everyone we meet, that, that they too may know how amazing you are and how loving and kind. Lord, we lift up those who are hurting right now, who are in the midst of their own storms. Lord, we pray for those who are in the hospital right now, those who are, um, those with babies who have had a rough start to life, who we know that you brought into the world, and we pray your peace and your healing and your blessing on them. Lord, we do thank you for the ways that you have tended us in all of our needs. We pray for the city of Pittsburgh, and we pray, Lord, that you would heal the city, that you would heal the people that are in brokenness right now, that you would reach out to, to those who are lost, that you would unite the church, not just this church, but churches throughout the city, so that we together can proclaim the kingdom of God here. Lord, and help us to truly live as your dearly beloved sons and daughters, as we pray to our Father, as you taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, please rise now as we affirm our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <laughs> 